Welcome again to Ask the Pastor. Uh, last week, we looked at how do you interpret Scripture. This week, uh, we're looking at how do we get the different versions of Scripture. Uh, and again, this is going to be a, a lot of history, but I did want to point you to a passage of Scripture uh, where we get a clue as to the different aspects. Um, there are actually two passages that I want us to, uh, to look at. Um, in uh, uh, Second Corinth, uh, Second Timothy, and both of them are in Second Timothy. In Second Timothy, beginning of verse fourteen, uh, chapter three, verse fourteen. Second Timothy, chapter three, verse fourteen. Listen to what Paul writes. He's talking to Timothy, and he says, uh, "But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, that from childhood you have known." And here's the word: the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise toward salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 16, all scripture. Okay, so that's a different word than the Holy Scriptures. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be, uh, equ uh, may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Uh, the term he uses for Holy Scriptures is probably pointing us to the Old Testament. And then scripture uh, that he uses in verse 16 is all of it. Uh, even the letters that he's been sending to churches and the things that Peter has written. Um, and uh, at this point, perhaps even um, one of the gospels. Uh, so you have those two terms that point to Old Testament and New Testament. And then in chapter four, just a few uh, paragraphs later, in chapter four, verse 13, Paul says uh, to Timothy, he says, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come. And then here it is, and the books, especially the parchments. Books and parchments. Now the books is a term biblia, and it is, uh, uh, most likely a reference to the scrolls of the Old Testament that Paul had, uh, and he wanted those close to him. Parchments, a little bit different. That's membranous, uh, which uh, was used to write letters. And in some cases, something of a reusable kind of pad. Uh, it was uh, more durable than papyrus. Uh, and so... Uh, it is uh, possible that when Paul asked for the books and parchments, he's got Old Testament and the New Testament that he was writing. But regardless, one of the things that we see is that Scripture is made up of uh, one whole book, uh, Old Testament and New Testament. That's Scripture. Uh, the question is, how did we get the different versions of Scripture? And I want to try to answer that. It's going to come in three different ways. First, um, we believe, as Paul wrote in verse 16 and 17 of chapter 3, we believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So Old Testament and New Testament inspired by God, literal inspiration. We believe that God spoke. This is the Spirit of God speaking. This is uh, Genesis to Revelation is the voice of God, and it's absolute truth. So we believe that... Um, that all scripture is given. The original languages of scripture uh, are Hebrew, a little bit of uh, Aramaic, and Greek. All of those languages, the Hebrew language is Old Hebrew and it's not a living language. Aramaic was used during the first century uh, AD and it's not a living language. And Greek is Koine Greek and it's not a living language. Uh, and so you have this, um, uh, this book written by God through people given to us by the Holy Spirit and uh, you have uh, these different languages. Uh, the languages themselves uh, are up for interpretation and, and translation and that kind of thing. So uh, let me begin. How do we get the different versions of Scripture? It begins with manuscripts. Now, manuscripts are uh, different um, 
fragments or copies of Scripture in different languages, whether it's Hebrew, Latin, Greek, uh, 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 or another language uh, that, uh, that we have uh, copies of. These different manuscripts are dated um, uh, in uh, uh, different uh, times. Uh, for the Old Testament, we have, uh, since 1947, there were scrolls found of the Old Testament in the Qumran Caves. Uh, they're called the Dead Sea Scrolls, and uh, that discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, gave us the oldest manuscript of different books of the Old Testament. They were all Old Testament books. And uh, it gave us the oldest manuscript of, for instance, Isaiah, which was written, uh, that manuscript was written around 900 AD. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, written about 150 BC. Before 1947, before we found that um, manuscript, uh, in the Qumran caves, um, the old the the uh, oldest uh, copy of Isaiah was 900 A.D. So in Qumran, they found a manuscript that was 150 B.C. Uh, dated 150 B.C. Before that, we only had one that reached back to 900 A.D. It's a big span. Now the question is, why was there such a big span between? Uh, 150 B.C. and 900 A.D. Why didn't we have more manuscripts? The Old Testament had been written for some time, uh, for centuries. Uh, why didn't we have manuscripts? Well, one of the reasons is because uh, those who were responsible for uh, the Old Testament scrolls, after uh, a period of time, if the scrolls became uh, uh, damaged through use, uh, instead of uh, keeping them, uh, the teachers... Uh, the rabbis, the, uh, uh, the religious leaders, uh, would take those scrolls and they would bury them. Uh, instead of uh, just putting them in the trash, they would bury them. They believed that it was more important to have a good burial of the Word of God than it uh, risk being def uh, uh, defaced or uh, the holiness of God in some way besmirched by inappropriate use of the Old Testament. So they would uh, bury them like they were buried in the Qumran caves. It just so happens we were able to find uh, that copy. So we have the Old Testament. Uh, we have uh, manuscripts dating back to 150 BC. The New Testament was written somewhere between 45, 46 AD and 90 AD. The oldest book that we have in the New Testament is the book of Revelation, which we believe was written around 90 AD. The earliest copies of portions of the New Testament are dated back to 114 AD. So we have actual copies of the New Testament that are dated to 114 AD. Uh, complete copies of the New Testament are dated 325 AD. So Jesus was killed somewhere, uh, was crucified uh, somewhere around um, uh, mid uh, 40s, uh, early 40s, late 30s AD. And within um, uh, 50 years, the New Testament was completed by 90 AD. And then uh, we have copies of portions of that scripture uh, that date 114 AD, less than 100 years after Jesus was crucified and complete copies of the New Testament by 325 AD. Um, now you might say, well, that doesn't sound like a very reliable manuscript evidence. If the earliest is 4th century AD, then um, you know how do we know that the Bible is true? And this not a question that y'all have asked, but let me go ahead and touch this. The Bible has better manuscript evidence than any other ancient literature. There are far more ancient copies and portions of the Bible that uh, we have than any other ancient work. For example, there are seven manuscripts of Plato. Seven. There are 10 manuscripts of Livy's work. There are 10 manuscripts for Caesar's The Gallic Wars. Uh, 
There are 20 ancient copies of Tacitus. There are, and this is a big one, there are 643 ancient copies of Homer's Iliad. Yet the Bible has more has 5,366 ancient copies of the New Testament alone. We don't hear people debating whether Plato's uh, books are real or whether, uh, even though there are only seven ancient manuscripts, or uh, Livy, what they were, or Caesar's Gallic Wars, although there are only ten manuscripts, uh, we don't doubt Homer's Iliad. There are 643 ancient copies. Um, so why then would we doubt uh, the 5,366 copies of the New Testament alone? Now, the various manuscripts of the Bible uh, can create differences in our English Bible. Okay, So we're going to be talking about English translations. Um, the different manuscripts can create differences in words. For instance, Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20, the last um, big paragraph of Mark's gospel, uh, is not included in the earliest dated manuscripts. Other manuscripts, along with some of the church fathers and versions of other languages, do include Mark 16, 9 through 20. But the bulk of evidence favors Mark 16, 9 through 20 being added to the gospel later than its original writing. So Mark 16, 9 through 20, you don't hear me preaching from that passage um, because there is a vast majority of the manuscript evidence that would suggest this was probably not original to the writing. Um, because of the manuscript evidence like that, you have some, uh, in fact, in, in most copies of Scripture, you'll find that uh, Mark 16, 9 through 20 may be included in the text, but it will be bracketed. And, uh, and there'll be a little footnote that says, most ancient, earliest manuscripts do not include Mark 16, 9 through 20. Right? So as you look at Scripture, um, different English translations are going to depend upon different manuscripts that will have some differences to them. Whether those are scribal errors or uh, uh, people copying Scripture, they didn't have uh, uh, copying machines. They copied them by hand. And sometimes um, a word um, might be miscopied. Also, another aspect of, of uh, the manuscripts is... Um, periods, semicolons, exclamation points, and commas. Do you know that Hebrew did not have, by and large for the bulk of the Old Testament, didn't have um, uh, any of those demarcations? Now, if you were to pick up uh, uh, Biblia Stuttgartensia, which is a Hebrew Bible, if you were to pick that up today, you would find that there are punctuation marks, but for the bulk of the copying of the Old Testament and even the New Testament, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, punctuation marks were not part of that, which can lead to challenges in manuscript evidence on what word was intended. Um, so that leads to not only do you have some minor differences in manuscripts. And when you have a difference in manuscript, usually you go with um, you go with the harder reading, the more challenging reading, whether it's challenging theologically or um, uh, has different ideas, or you go with the earliest manuscripts, uh, or you go with um, external evidence. Uh, does this fit in the overall scheme of what we find in the most reliable portions of Scripture? All those things help us discern which manuscripts have the right words or phrases. But that also leads to another challenge in translation, and that is language. When you have different, different languages, especially non-living languages, it can become challenging to discern exactly what those words mean, especially when it comes to words in Hebrew and Greek that uh, have a wide range of nuance in meaning. Um, uh, so uh, let me give an example. Um, now, uh, when you have uh, 
um, the uh, um, uh, translations of Scripture, uh, it, it worked like this. So first, you had the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So um, there was a group called the Seventy, uh, and they translated the Old Testament Hebrew into Greek. Now, that's called the Septuagint. And uh, the Septuagint um, moved Greek, uh, Hebrew to Greek. And those differences in language can be significant or not so significant. So, for instance, Isaiah 7, verse 14, the Hebrew reads, Behold the Alma, which means young woman. I believe it can mean also virgin. Behold the Alma shall conceive. The Septuagint reads, Behold the Parthenos shall conceive. Parthenos literally means virgin. So Alma can mean young woman or virgin. Parthenos can only mean virgin. So in that translation, they went from... Uh, uh, a wide range of meaning of Alma, young woman, young maiden, uh, a, a virgin, and they determined that Parthenos was the best word to fit Alma, which is virgin. So you, you, uh, you uh, look at that and you see that uh, those um, um, decisions were made, and we believe those decisions were, were good and right. But uh, that was the 3rd century B.C. The Old Testament Hebrew was translated into Greek. Uh, in the late 4th century A.D., uh, a guy named Jerome uh, began translating both Old Testament and New Testament into Latin. So the language, popular language of the day, the, the national language, went from um, Greek to Latin. So uh, Jerome began translating Old and New Testament into Latin. That's called the Vulgate. The Vulgate was the primary version used in the Roman Catholic Church until John Wycliffe translated the Bible into Middle English in 1382. Uh, then Tyndale translated the New Testament and his followers translated the whole Bible, 1526, 1535. The Geneva Bible was uh, translated uh, from Latin into English in 1560. And then King James authorized version, 1611, came about. Now, uh, Wycliffe translated mostly from Latin. Tyndale translated from the Vulgate. Uh, most, uh, tra uh, Tyndale translated mostly from the Vulgate, although he did uh, uh, look to the original language of the Greek and the Hebrew. The Geneva Bible uh, translated again, uh, primarily from the Latin, but again, used uh, some of the Greek and the Hebrew of the original language. And King James was primarily translated from the Vulgate. Um, and it wasn't until later, after 1611, that they began to look at the Hebrew and Greek. So uh, when the Vulgate uh, was translated into, um, uh, when the Greek and the Hebrew were translated into Latin, uh, that's the Bible of uh, the Middle Ages. And again, most people didn't speak Latin. It was only the educated and the priests. And so anyway, uh, the English translations that came from the Vulgate reflect that. And sometimes the Vulgate did not represent what the original Greek and Hebrew meant or had differences there. So when it comes from uh, comes to translating from uh, the Bible language of Hebrew and Greek to uh, modern translations, um, there are two different ways you can do it. So uh, suppose I were to take my Hebrew Bible, my Greek uh, New Testament, my Hebrew Old Testament, my Greek New Testament, and I were to translate those into English. Uh, after the early English versions, uh, then you have... Um, some decisions to make. You can go a, a literal translation, which would be closer to word for word, or you can uh, go from, uh, uh, instead of word for word, you can do um, thought for thought. 
Uh, word for word is called formal equivalence translation. Thought for thought is called dynamic equivalence. Let me give you an example. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Here's the Greek. Dio anatsotsamenoi tas asfuas tes dianoias humon nefontes telai os el pesate epitain ferromenein human in apokalupsai Jesu Christu. That's the Greek. That's the original Greek, Koine Greek. Uh, the literal translation, the most literal translation, the word for word is, therefore, girding up the loins of your mind, being sober, completely place hope upon the delivered grace to you in or by the revealing of Jesus Christ. Okay? Doesn't read too well, but that's the most literal. The New American Standard Version is uh, a word-for-word -word or a literal formal equivalence translation. Here's how a New American Standard translates. It says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now compare that to the New King James. Therefore, Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Where the Greek literally says, gird up the loins of your mind. New American Standard said, let's translate that as prepare your minds for action, which is the idea of girding up the loins of your mind, but there's translation there. New King James decided to keep um, the literalness of gird up the loins of your mind. The King James Version, the same way, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there was uh, King James, New King James, and, and New American Standard. Uh, New American Standard determined they were going to uh, take gird the loins of your mind and interpret that as prepare your minds for action. And uh, it doesn't stop there. So then you have the more um, dynamic equivalence, the uh, English Standard Version, the ESV. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. They made a decision, not, not just prepare your minds, New American Standard. They said, let's do prepare your minds for action. So there's more thought process in what that means. Then the NIV, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at His coming. Now, there are a lot of words in the NIV that aren't in the original language. There are ideas, I think, that fit the original language, but there are a lot of words here that are missing um, in the NIV, that are in the original language, and that uh, are included in the NIV that aren't part of the original language. And then the New Living Translation, which is the most um, uh, 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 free-flowing uh, dynamic equivalence or thought for thought, it says, so prepare your minds for action and s exercise self-control. So they, they move a little bit further. Prepare your minds for action, where it was gird the loins of your mind, then prepare your minds, then prepare your minds for action, um, and then New Living says, prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control, being fully sober, uh, being sober-minded. Again, differences in uh, uh, taking the same idea but putting different words in there. Then it goes on, New Living, put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the, end, to the world. Again, each of these translations uh, are right, uh, but there's language included in the more dynamic translations or language that's missing in the more uh, dynamic translations that aren't in the original language. And that's why we have so many different English translations. Uh, it's not just the manuscript and it's not just the differences in language. It is uh, are we translating word for word or thought for thought? Now, people have asked me, why do I not like the New International Version, NIV? Um, there are 
are uh, translation choices that the NIV, NIV made several years ago, more than uh, two decades ago, uh, that um, stretched the translating uh, too far, in my opinion. Uh, it doesn't mean the NIV is bad. I've memorized scripture out of the NIV. You'll hear it uh, when I quote scripture. Sometimes I include some NIV language. Um, and uh, for instance, last uh, two weeks ago, I, I, I quoted Romans 12, 1 and 2. In verse 2, it says, uh, Do not be conformed any longer to the mold of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And here's the phrase that's NIV, which is your spiritual service of worship. You're not going to find that in the New King James or the King James. That's the, that's the NIV. So it's not that I despise the NIV. It's just that I think that there are better choices. If you prefer NIV uh, and the way it reads, I would encourage you to go to uh, the Holman Standard Bible or the uh, English Standard Version. Uh, even the New Living Translation, I think, is a better option than a NIV. But that's just me. And you'll it, it, it's, it's not a problem anyway. Uh, but you have manuscripts, you have language, and then you have translation options. And all of that leads to the various translations we have uh, for us today. Um, but they reflect uh, the original languages uh, and help us hear the voice of God. Next week, we're going to be look, looking at the question, how did we get different denominations? And in order to get there, we're going to take seven weeks to evaluate how do we get the different denominations. It's a bigger question than just a few words. Um, we're going to take uh, what did the church believe in the first through third century? What did the church believe in the Middle Ages? What did the church believe right before the Reformation? What did the church believe during the Reformation or coming out of the Reformation? What did the Anabaptists believe, which were it's the radical Reformation? Um, and then what did the churches believe after the Reformation? And then uh, in the seventh uh, session, we'll uh, go through the history of denominations. How did we get all these different denominations? But we've got to have the bedrock before we get to the seventh. All right, let's share the benediction together. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise. To him be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. God bless you. Good night.